Um, so I, uh, as I said, I'm Amanda Stevens. Uh, so I work in uh, NYSERDA's Environmental Research Program. Um, and our program's mission is really to support research to be the scientific foundation for energy and envi environmental policy in the state. Um, you know, that's been in the past things like mercury deposition, acid rain, air quality, uh, all of those sorts of things. And my focus has been on climate change impacts and adaptation research, which is where this assessment really comes in. Um, so the assessment will be providing up to date information on impacts and actionable information on adapting to those impacts. Um, you might be familiar with our last statewide assessment, which we called Climate. That was about 10 years ago or so now. Uh, this will be similar, but with updates in the science and approach and products, of course. Um, so we'll be providing up to date projections of future climate conditions in the state. Uh, we'll be doing an in-depth in economic assessment this time around. Um, and we'll, in addition to the technical chapters, we're also going to be providing some other materials and, and outputs to hopefully be designed for various audiences and, and needs. I will note that um, this assessment is research driven by our program's miss mission. So it's not a governmental mandate, like something like the National Climate Assessment or California's. Uh, it's also not an adaptation plan. It doesn't prescribe or dictate policy. It's not a policy or political document, but it's grounded in the science and the information that's out there. Uh, but through that, we hope that this assessment work, will, again, will provide the scientific foundation for good climate policy in, in New York, um, as the rest of our program does. And really at all levels of decision making, whether that's an individual um, or a community or the state agency. So there's a lot of other initiatives in the state that you're probably familiar with. Um, many of them are aimed more at the causes of climate change. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy use, that sort of thing. But, but this assessment, again, is really focused on the physical climate changes, the impacts of those changes across the state and ways that we can adapt to or prepare for those impacts. So we have eight different work groups that are focused on different sectors of the state, and you can see those here. And in addition to those sectors, uh, we are also addressing several cross-cutting themes, um, equity in underserved communities, municipal government concerns, marine coastal zones, and Great Lakes. Um, these were themes that we felt really touched every one of the eight sectors, and we wanted to make sure uh, that every sector did it indeed discuss them and address those um, those uh, themes. So it's part of every technical work group's job to really address those. As I said, we'll, we're also doing an economic impacts analysis uh, with uh, IEC, who's our contractor for that. Uh, and they're modeling the, the impacts of climate change on different aspects of each sector as feasible. It really depends on what models are out there and what really can be modeled quantitatively. Um, so they're looking at economic damages under a couple of emission scenarios, uh, the differences between those, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll start to get at some of those differences and damages with and without emissions reductions. As feasible, we're also gonna be looking at um, the impacts of adaptation strategies. So hopefully getting at that cost of no action versus the cost of adaptation uh, issue. There aren't a lot of models out there right now that really do this well. So it's not gonna be as comprehensive as the overall analysis, um, but for as, as much as we can, and as many models are out there that will do it, we'll be looking at those. Um, so we are, as I mentioned, working with Columbia uh, to provide downscaled uh, projections for the state. Uh, we've reworked the regions. If you are familiar with Climate, we had seven regions uh, back then. Um, they were a little bit unwieldy. Uh, so we've reworked those regions a little bit to align more closely with the NOAA climate regions. Um, you'll see here that some of the counties uh, are actually shaded into two climate regions, and we're looking at the one on the right here. Um, and that's really to convey that those counties uh, do include multiple climate regions, uh, and therefore we need to, they may need to think about different kinds of impacts. Um, Essex County, for example, which is up way up in the, in the northeast there, borders both Lake Champlain and the Adirondacks, and those are very different climates, so that's the kind of thing that um, communities in that county might need to think about, you know, different, uh, different impacts. 
So we'll be doing the same variables as we did in climate. So looking at average uh, annual average temperature and precipitation, um, extremes, we're looking at um, both hot and cold days, looking at heat waves, um, days over one and two inches of, of precipitation and sea level rise. We do have some additions this time around. Uh, we're looking at for temperature and precip precipitation. We're not we're doing not only annual but also monthly and seasonal. And we're also going out uh, by decade through 2100. So last time around we did um, I think 2020s, 2050s, and 2080s. And that's mostly what we'll be presenting to the public, but we will have available um, all other decades in between if, if anyone needs that, uh, that information. We're also adding days over 95 degrees and days over four inches of rain. And then uh, a couple of new variables. We're looking at heat index and cooling and heating degree days. We'll also have some qualitative discussions. So there's some variables that we're not going to be able to model right now, um, but we still want to talk about you know, what trends are showing, what the, uh, what the literature is saying about probably what's going to happen. And that's things like nor'easters and tropical cyclones, winter precipitation, that sort of thing. So the new projections are unfortunately aren't quite ready to share yet. Um, so these examples that I'm showing are from the 2014 climate update that we did. Um, is there also as a reminder, these use the old regions. So they're um, gonna look a little bit different than uh, what you see when the new ones come out. But this gives you an idea of, of the kinds of things we're talking about, the, the ways that we're thinking about presenting them. Um, we'll give the, the low and middle range and high estimate of what the models are showing. Um, so just in general, uh, you know, winters are fast, warming faster than summers. Um, we're expecting warmer temperatures with more longer and hotter heat waves, um, more frequent and intense precipitation events, as well as droughts, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but I, we think we've seen that already even this year. Um, you know, warmer air holds more moisture, so we get longer periods of drought as the air holds on to that, but then it dumps it all at once in bigger events. So uh, again, with, we've, we've seen some of that already, so it's not, um, although it seems counterintuitive, you know, it, it does happen. And then, of course, increased sea level rise and coastal flooding. Um, and from that flooding, we're talking both uh, or, or all of permanent inundation, um, periodic and tidal flooding, and then higher storm surge as well. So what I'm going to show here now are uh, some kind of, well, what does that mean? <laughs> There's some of the impacts that those uh, climate changes are actually going to have on our systems here in the state. So what I'm going to be presenting are just a few things that I've gleaned from our technical chapter work. Um, there's so much more detail there, and uh, I'll be really excited for you to go take a look at that once they're released. Um, but these are just some points to think about. Uh, in the meantime, and as you go through the next few days of this conference. Um, so on sort of water resources, traditionally uh, side of things, drinking water, we're looking at uh, risks to water wells uh, from both drought and evaporative water loss from higher temperatures that can affect the recharge rate of those wells. Uh, drinking water systems that are uh, actually pulling from the river, particularly along the Hudson, are at risk from salt front extension due to drought and sea level rise. Uh, and then there's increased contamination risk from flooding and heavy rain. On the infrastructure side of things, um, you know, if, if we have more power outages due, due to storms and things like that, there's a risk of loss of pumping equipment and other, other equipment. Um, and while most, if not all systems, I think right now, or plants are required to have backup um, power, if that backup power is uh, at risk for, due to flooding or things like that, that can be an issue as well. Things like pipe rupture, rupture from flooding, winter heave, uh, soil movement due to drought, um, potential dam failures if uh, the probable maximum flood uh, actually increases and the standards aren't changed to match those increases, that could be an issue. Uh, and then uh, there's a, likely to be an increased burden on treatment plants due to this more contamination from runoff uh, during these heavy storm events. Water affordability is another one. Uh, one example that could cause that uh, issue 
uh, is, you know, we're talking about adapting to all of these um, impacts and that will come at a cost. Uh, and if that cost is just simply passed on to consumers without equity concerns taken into account, uh, that could cause affordability issues. On health sides of things, um, as uh, I think Emily mentioned, likely potential for more harmful algal blooms, which has uh, have health issues or can have health impacts. Higher exposures to mold pathogens, waterborne diseases, again, this flooding and heavy rain um, really has a lot of uh, different impacts. On the ecosystem side of things, um, we're really blessed here in New York to have a lot of different aquatic ecosystems and they all could be impacted by climate change going forward. Uh, on the lake side of things, <clears throat> excuse me, changes in temperature, ice cover, uh, stratification can change the oxygenation level of lakes, uh, which can be a challenge for cold water fisheries and other species. Um, again, these harmful algal blooms, not only a health risk to people, but can also disrupt uh, ecosystems as well. On the wetland side, we're thinking about stress from drought, uh, erosion and eutrophication from extreme storms. Um, and it's likely that it's really the small and disconnected wetlands that are going to be most at risk from this sort of thing. The, um, the larger wetland network networks are likely to at least have some buffering uh, ability, but this, these smaller ones uh, could have more trouble. Uh, estuaries, uh, precipitation increases could alter the chemistry of waters, changing habitat quality, um, altering locations and shifting species uh, in the estuaries. Uh, on the rivers, again, this rainfall, heavier rainfall, more of it, uh, bigger storms, uh, all of that can disrupt uh, the riparian vegetation, uh, disrupt the, the species that are there and uh, raise seasonal water levels as well. And then again, this uh, the same issue of the, the changing oxygenation uh, could have uh, could stress the cold water river species as well. And then across the board, we're looking at invasives, uh, whether we're talking about aquatic ecosystems or um, or terrestrial. Uh, these really are a big concern now, uh, and they're going to continue to be going into the future as well. So getting out of the water specific impacts a little bit, and I'm, I'm really glad to see there's going to be an in-depth presentation later on this, so this, I'll just tee this up a little bit. Um, so this is something that we have uh, come across in our, and have thought about before in, in our work through this assessment, um, that really vulnerabilities from climate change intersect with and exacerbate existing underlying and systemic social stressors uh, and fragilities. So, um, you know, lower income, indigenous, black and brown populations are more vulnerable already due to other forms of social and economic disadvantage and marginalization, uh, whether we're talking about legacies of displacement, historical and ongoing racial and ethnic discrimination, lack of access to resources, greater exposure to environmental pollutants. So all of these are already in place and climate change is just going to make all of that worse. Um, for the water sector in particular, uh, indigenous communities have a, have a really strong connection to their local waters and ecosystems, and they may experience disproportionate impacts from climate change. Uh, you know, there are a number of environmental justice organizations um, that have had a leading role in drawing attention to these connections and these concerns. Um, you know, New York City based organizations such as We Act and UpRose have developed community centered climate change response strategies, mobilizing their local communities. Um, Buffalo uh, communities or organizations like Push Buffalo have, have again mobilized their communities uh, with a focus on some of this environmental justice. Um, there are some tribal nations that are situated within New York that have developed adaptation plans, drawing on their traditional ecological knowledge, uh, looking at proactive strategies uh, that, that really respond to climate change pressures on their valued ecological resources and cultural traditions. However, we shouldn't really make these vulnerable communities shoulder the burden alone. Um, you know, every sector and community in the state has the potential to identify and contribute to climate adaptation responses that reduce these vulnerabilities and enhance resilience. So just something that, uh, that you know, we want to be aware of as we're thinking through adaptation. 
Um, and for this assessment, we've actually asked each work group to highlight these kind of disproportionate burdens uh, that climate change will bring so that we can, uh, you know, as a, as a society, start thinking through some of these issues. So timeline for the assessment, uh, we kicked this off um, in September of 2021. Um, the, the working groups have done phenomenal work since then. Um, and the latest drafts of each chapter will actually be coming in the next few weeks. Um, really excited about the work that they've done so far. Um, and we're hoping to have peer review probably early next year uh, and publishing to come after that. And again, that's really for the technical uh, chapters, hopefully in early 2023. But we do hope to, to create other, uh, other outputs. So if you were familiar with ClimAid, you know that it was just this one giant technical report. Um, that's really all that we had the resources to, to produce back then. Uh, but this time we do have the ability to create more than just that. So we want to we want to develop some other outputs that are focused on particular audiences and particular needs so that we can really get that information out there in ways that are useful to, to different, uh, different audiences. So to stay up to date, uh, there are a few ways you can do this. Uh, we have our website up and you're welcome to take a look at that whenever you want to. Uh, we have an updates page on that with uh, news and uh, new information that's coming out. Uh, and you can also subscribe to a newsletter there. We will not inundate your inbox, don't worry. It's very few and far between, uh, but they will provide you with updates on where the assessment stands. And then you can also follow us uh, on Twitter at our Twitter handle there. So i um, happy to answer any questions that I could. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's really exciting to hear about this project and um, all of the various impacts that we've tried to pack into this conference on the one slide. Um, I also saw a really great blog post come out on the social media on water and climate in particular. So make sure, make sure you take a look at that. Um, so we've got a question here about forest planning and management issues and where that might fit in. Um, do forests and trees, will that be fit into any particular sector or committee? Um, and how will that be addressed in the climate impacts assessment process? Yeah, we do have, uh, have a sector that's focused on ecosystems and that is a very broad sector. <laughs> I have more power to them for all of the, the ecosystem types that they have to cover. Uh, and forests is part of that, uh, including management and forestry. Uh, so that will be covered there. Great, thank you. When the report comes out, how will you be disseminating the information to local decision makers? So we are working on that. Uh, one thing I did not mention uh, is that we have, in addition to the working groups and um, also did not mention, so the working groups are made up of uh, different people with different backgrounds this time around. So Climate was really, solely academics really who were developing the chapters. This time around, we really wanted to, to try to bring in some practitioners and um, you know people who would use the information as well to actually develop the chapters. Um, so there are on some of the work groups, there are uh, some community participants and those who work with communities. And we hope that uh, you know the idea is that some of uh, they'll use some of their networks to get the information out that way. Um, in addition to the working groups, we also have each sector has a group of sector advisors, again, who are really there to broaden the perspectives uh, and include a lot, uh, a lot of the kind of on the ground people who are actually doing the work and really involved in this uh, kind of information or needing this information. So that will be another way that we hope to get the information out. Um, and then we're going to be exploring other other ways, um, and we're certainly more than more than open to suggestions on you know either networks we should uh, reach out to, and how would we reach out to those particular networks. Um, so very very much open to different ways of disseminating this information because we don't want it to just sit on the shelf. So thank you for that question. Great, thank you. Um, 
do you think there might be an opportunity to provide the assessment results to the climate smart community task forces that are in the municipalities? Absolutely could do that. Uh, I know we have at least one, if not two folks uh, involved who are uh, in those climate smart community um, networks. But yeah, it, I think it would be great to uh, to provide that information, not only to um, maybe the uh, forget what they're called now, the coordinators, but also, you know, if there are ways to get that out to the communities themselves through a webinar or something like that um, would be a great way to do it. Great, thank you. Um, will there be geospatial projection data available online at ArcGIS or other streaming services? We are working that out. Uh, we hope so. Um, the the one thing that we're trying to work through is that the um, <clears throat> the projections are done at a relatively coarse resolution, so it's not even county scale. It's these kind of twelve regions, um, and the the projections were also done by Columbia um, at a station level. So they're really um, you know a few points within each region that these were done at. So we're trying to work out how do we translate that into you know, a GIS map that would be um, useful to users. So we are working on it. It may, it may be something that's not available right away because we want to also make sure that we do it well and don't just throw something out there because we have to do it quickly. Uh, so we are working on that. It may take some time to do, but we, we hope to do something like that. Great, thank you. Um, this assessment is going to be published after New York State finalizes its scoping plan for meeting state climate targets. Will the State Climate Action Council be using this information to refine that plan moving forward? I can't say for sure, but that's certainly uh, the hope and part of the idea of, of you know, the basis for this assessment. Yeah, the, the timing didn't quite work out. We, we started this, I think, before um, or right around the time that the Climate Action Council was formed. Uh, that they were given their their deadlines and their mandates. So it, the timing did not quite line up. Um, however, I you know as you kind of alluded to, I don't I, I doubt that this um, scoping plan will be the end of what the Climate Action Council does. So as future iterations maybe come out or uh, you know things like that, this information will be there uh, for them to lean on. Great, thank you, and. Is carbon sequestration a part of the research informing um, some of these calculations and modeling on climate impacts? So this one is, uh, this is not doing a whole lot on carbon sequestration because that is more focused on uh, kind of the emissions side of things uh, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We're not looking at that kind of thing here. So there's not gonna be a lot of discussion of it. Um, there might be some where there are, you know, if we're talking about co-benefits, things like that, uh, we certainly aren't ignoring the fact that mitigation, climate mitigation is, an, is a need. Uh, and so we're kind of talking about it a little bit, but it won't be a, a big focus of, of what we're doing here. Great, thank you. Um, so you mentioned invasive species as a cross-cutting issue across many of the different sectors. Um, are there any sections specifically on impacts to native and common species that may become less common or what might be the impacts? Um, I would have to go back and read the chapters to see if there's any discussion of that. I think there is some, but I don't hold me to that. Um, so I know, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not certain to the extent that that discussion goes on, but uh, I think it was covered to some degree. Great, thank you. Um, that, was great, that was not a great answer, sorry. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information here and, and speaking of follow up, because that's a good uh, transition. Um, there was a uh, ask for a link to the climate report, the original report, and also if you could share your slides so people had them for future reference. And so I'll mention too that if uh, there's material shared in these presentations that we'll be sharing those links and resources with attendees as well. So you'll have the that information along with the recordings of these presentations. Um, so Amanda, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you.